Have you ever been in the situation where one of your colleagues came up to you and said, hey, you know that patient that you discharged last shift? Well, they came back and this is what happened. Hey, welcome back everybody to Ultrason Grand Rounds this week. I am really excited to be here today. Um, that whole idea of patients coming back, man, that happens from time to time. And it can be very terrifying to know kind of what happened and what did I miss, right? And today we're going to talk about one of those topics. We're going to talk about ultrasound for necrotizing fasciitis, which is in that spectrum of skin and soft tissue infections that we've been covering over the last couple weeks. Uh, and we're going to dive into that. But before we do that, um, hopefully you found these things helpful, these lectures helpful. If you haven't had a chance yet to see any of the lectures that we've given about about ultrasound for skin and soft tissue infections and then the lumps and bumps tissue that we did, or lecture that we did last week, head on over back to the YouTube channel where we've got those posted up. While you're there, give us a subscribe, a like, a thumbs up, all those things that really help us out um, in our preparation of this material for you, but also helps you understand when we put new material out so you can learn all of this stuff. But with that being said, we're gonna dive into this idea of ultrasound for necrotizing fasciitis and see how our ultrasound today can maybe help us get into that diagnosis so really not put in that situation of, hey, you remember that time that you sent that patient home? Well, guess what? They're back. Giving us all another reason to distrust homemade zip lines, a Georgia woman has had her leg amputated after contracting a rare flesh-eating bacterial infection from a zip line related injury. Amy Copeland, a master's student at the University of West Georgia, is in critical condition in Augusta, where what started as a cut resulted in the amputation of her left leg at the hip. Copeland was using a homemade zip line with her friends on the Little Tallapoosa River. When the line snapped, she fell and cut her leg. Doctors believe the common bacteria, Aeromonas hydrophila, entered her body through the wound. The resulting infection, called necrotizing fasciitis, is described as rare but dramatic. It can spread extremely quickly and often results in the loss of limbs or life. Amy may still have her hands and right foot amputated due to poor circulation. And if you're still thinking about homemade zip lining, just remember, Necrotizing fasciitis photos make anti-smoking ads look like child's play. Today we're going to talk about ultrasound for necrotizing fasciitis. Um, as always, no disclosures to make that are pertinent to this case. And if you like a little bit of an outline, kind of a, an idea of where we're going to go with this, um, here's kind of our objective today. We're going to talk a little bit about necrotizing fasciitis in general, like what is this entity, and kind of remind ourselves from a clinical perspective and a little bit of a historical perspective what's going on. And then secondly, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the ultrasound findings of necrotizing fasciitis and how our bedside ultrasound can help out in making this diagnosis, uh, how it can help out in patient management, um, looking, a little, looking at a little bit of the literature uh, to see what we need to know for necrotizing fasciitis. So with that said, let's dive in. Um, the first point of today is what is necrotizing fasciitis? And we obviously saw a, a terrifying news clip of someone who had an unfortunate injury uh, that resulted in the amputation of limbs. Um, but essentially, uh, um, you know, here's an example of, you know, of a fasciotomy of someone who had necrotizing fasciitis. And it's a, it's a very serious illness. And if you want to talk about it more in a colloquial terms, you know, we can look back in some of the news articles and say, you know, here's an example of like a, a, a Detroit kid with a, a flesh eating disease. Right. That's one of the ways that it's talked about um, flesh eating bacteria. Um, you know, is one of the 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 t terms that's used uh, as we look kind of in the news. Um, and again, um, flesh eating bacteria. Uh, so if we go into the various different um, medical reference materials that we can look at, uh, we get various different definitions. But one of them from Tintin Alley's, our, our very favorite Tintin Alley's emergency medicine, basically says it's a spectrum of illness characterized fulminant, extensive, soft tissue necrosis and s systemic toxicity. And it carries with it a very, very high mortality, right? And if you go to Medscape, the ubiquitous Medscape, it's a rapidly defined it as a rapidly progressive inflammatory infection of the fascia with secondary necrosis of the subcutaneous tissue. It doesn't sound quite as terrifying there, uh, but if we hop over to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, they even talking about it and they said it's a severe soft tissue infection that is caused by bacteria such as group A strep or MRSA and is marked by edema and necrosis of the subcutaneous tissue or tissues with involvement of adjacent fascia and by painful red swollen skin over the affected area. 
Don't you love it how the dictionary tends to be a little bit more uh, descriptive than than our medical references? If we can kind of put all those together, the composite definition of, sub, of necrotizing fasciitis, it's basically in the spectrum of skin and soft tissue diseases, right? Uh, we've seen these. We talked about these with cellulitis, with the, with the abscess. But what's characteristic of this is the fact that there's a lot of necrosis that happens way down at the fascial level, which is very, very difficult to, for us to get, a, get our hands around and get our heads around from a clinical perspective. Um, without any you know, advanced imaging such as ultrasound, CT, MRI, etc. Um, and so what happens is these patients get really, really sick because that's a, a place where the, the infection can spread and we may have a delay in the presentation. And so that sickness, that, that severe illness carries with it a very, very high mortality where some resources say that the mortality for neck fascia is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 40%, right? Which is pretty terrifying when you think about it. You have someone who may look decently fine, at least skin surface, but then they have a mortality that's 40%. And this is really the, the, um, the reason why you get a lot of those follow-ups and your colleagues saying, Hey, you know, that patient that you saw the other day, I, they came back and I admitted them or they, they had necrotizing fasciitis or they went to the OR. And, and, you know, if you're unfortunate enough to have, um, you know, more severe ones, then it may be something that, you know, was seen and, um, you know, and the patient didn't do so well. So anyway, this is um, kind of the spectrum of illness that we're talking about. Now, if we turn back the, t the uh, you know, the pages of history, right, we can see references to necrophizing fasciitis all the way back to the time of Hippocrates, right? Um, you, when we think back of the early, early eras of modern medicine, the people that were very influential in, in what we consider modern medicine, it would be Hippocrates and Galen, right? Those two famous physicians. And Hippocrates described uh, something that represented necrotizing fasciitis. Then fast forward, you know, thousand-ish some odd years to the 1800s, to the American Civil War, right? Uh, there was a, a surgeon, there's a Confederate surgeon named Dr. Joseph Jones. And he described a little over 2,600 cases of what he called hospital gangrene, right? These patients who had severe infection Infections, right, that carried with them about a 40 some odd percent mortality, 46 percent mortality. Right. And here's an example of an image that may have been characteristic of what he would describe. And I remember when I was a kid, right, I, um, I was a huge Civil War buff. And I don't I don't know if it was the aesthetic of the Civil War as a kid that I was interested in or playing Civil War or it was actually like a huge interest or fascination with the, the the actual history of it. But that being said, I really enjoyed learning about the Civil War as a kid. And we went to various reenactments and various Civil War you know, events that were in the area uh, where I grew up. And I remember asking the question, um, cause I was a kid, right? I was curious, like the, of the, the reenactor that was there is that, Hey, who, or what, what was the, the bigger cause of death in the civil war? Was it bullets or was it bayonets? Right. And the response was caught me off guard and it was infection. Right. And it was kind of dissatisfied with that one as a kid because I'm like, infection what I, the bullets are cooler right and then, then some infection um, but when you think about it fast forward to now and think about it like it makes a lot of sense that when you have poor sterilization techniques poor antiseptic techniques that infection could be a huge deal and so the fact that dr. Joseph Jones saw almost 3,000 cases of this this what we now know as necrotizing fasciitis that led to a high mortality is not terribly surprising right so as we kind of go through our our continued you know, traverse through uh, through history, uh, the next important character that we need to, to look at is this guy named Jean-Alfred Fournier, right? You can criticize my French and all those French people who are listening to the YouTube certainly can drop a comment in the, in the, the comments below about whether I did a good job or bad job uh, describing the French. But that being said, Dr. Fournier uh, described, he was a French dermatologist and he specialized in venereal diseases and he described what's now nor known as Fournier's gangrene, which is a form of necrotizing fasciitis of the perineum. Now, parenthetically, um, since the early days of my medical career, I thought it would be really, really cool to have some disease entity or some exam finding or some whatever named after me, right? The Tabbit sign or the Tabbit disease or whatever the case may be. Um, now, Unfortunately, as a healthcare community, uh, for me at least, we're getting away from named diseases and signs and kind of describing them more based on their anatomic uh, or physiologic terms, which 
probably is better for future generations of, of physicians. Um, but I've also kind of known in the back of my mind, if I had a, a named disease, it would probably be my luck to have it named after something unfortunate like Dr. Fournier's um, you know, name here. Um, but that being said, Dr. Fournier um, was the guy who originally described what's known as Fournier's gangrene. And then as we continue on, we can pop, or hop up into our last century now. Uh, it's hard it's, you know, hard to imagine that we're saying that. Uh, but the 1950s, right, Dr. B. Wilson uh, was the first person in the literature to describe the term that we now know as necrotizing fasciitis, right? So we've seen that this entity has been you know, evident and has been described throughout history. But now what we know is necrotizing fasciitis was really coined in the mid 1950s. Um, and that's kind of where we leave off on our history tour and head over to more of a description of what is this entity that we can wrap our minds around so that we can then apply ultrasound to it. Right. So from a clinical standpoint, um, Necrotizing fasciitis is well documented in the literature. Right. Um, they're they're estimating that. Um, it's about 3.5 per 100,000 uh, cases, um, you know, in the United States. Um, they say there's perhaps increased incidence in, in um, African and Asian continents. Um, but the frequency, according to the sources that I was quoting here, is it's rising, right? And so uh, it's certainly not the most common thing that we see in the emergency department. That's maybe one takeaway. But it is something that we do see in the emergency department. And as I think back over my career, I can definitely pull out, pull that thread and remember a number of cases over the last you know decade or so of patients who either we diagnosed with with necrotizing fasciitis in the ED, or we saw and subsequently returned when they got worse and were subsequently then diagnosed with necrotizing fasciitis. And so certainly something that we need to keep our minds open to, right? Something that we need to keep our eyes um, attuned to because it carries with this a very large mortality, right? Um, you know, whenever they say like 20 to 100%, it's like zero to 100% mortality. Like, Okay, they either don't or you do die. But like here, like we're talking about, you know, the literature reports somewhere between 20 and 80% mortality. I think the num exact number is not necessarily the precise thing that's important, but the reality that is that a 20%, even at the best odds, is still a substantial mortality. And if it's 80%, right, that's really, really bad. And the numbers that I've, other numbers I've seen have kind of settled out in that 40% range. And so anything with a 40% mortality should really get our attention, really help us to kind of learn and understand what's going on here and how we identify this early. So clinically, what does it look like? It starts with, it's basically this local progressive skin infection, right? So we talked about what cellulitis looks like a couple weeks ago is kind of this area of erythema, the area of tenderness um, uh, that we see on the skin surface. But unfortunately, under the surface is where all the badness happens. And that leads to some degree of bacteremia, right? And that bacteremia then can lead to sepsis. The sepsis leads to multiple organ failure. And then ultimately, that's what contributes to the patient's demise and they, they, if left untreated, you know, die. It's the unfortunate reality of this. Uh, so how does this happen, right? Um, what causes necrotizing fasciitis? How can we identify this so that we can maybe prevent this thing uh, from happening or know who we need to worry about, right? Um, essentially, the cause is some degree of trauma compromising skin integrity, right? Um, or some viscous rupture kind of internally, right? Sets up this infection and necr necrosis across that. Now, this is intentionally broad um, because this covers essentially every reason why you'd have every infection ever, right? Some compromise of your natural immune system uh, or your host barriers. But think about all the different ways that patients can have compromised skin integrity. And like, I guess we can back up and think about how amazing of an organ system our skin is in that it protects us from so much stuff uh, when it's intact, right? But then when you have some degree of break in that skin, and you know, it could be something as simple as just like some, you know, micro lacerations that you don't even recognize from something you scraped your arm on, right? All the way up to what stuff that we do all the time to patients put in IVs, right? Or maybe it's something that they came into the ED for, right? They had, you know, some laceration to their hand, uh, or they came in because they use IV drugs, right? Uh, or surgical site infections, right? All these are potential sources, um, you know, of these skin and soft tissue infections that have the potential to then become um, uh, necrotizing fasciitis if, you know, if it follows down that trajectory, right? So what, again, what constitutes trauma, surgical wounds, right? Um, you know, 
abscess drainages, IM, IV ejections, you know, the list goes on, right? How about risk factors? What puts patients at risk? Because maybe if we kind of, we've already broadly said, well, any break to the barrier system could do that. What, what, you know, what other things can maybe contribute to this that make the patient more susceptible? Again, long list of stuff, but I think at the center of it, we need to really keep in mind um, several different common entities that we see in the emergency department. Those are diabetes, right? This is a big, bad one. Like we don't oftentimes really appreciate fully what level of morbidity, right? And what level of mortality our patients with diabetes walk around with on a daily basis, right? If we can, we can take a lot of the different conversations that we have uh, in bedside ultrasound and say diabetes is a risk factor in each and every single one of those different entities, whether it goes, whether it's heart disease or, you know, or lung disease or here skin and soft tissue disease, or even as we transition in a few, you know, a few weeks to like more OB type uh, presentations, it leads to OB complications, right? Diabetes is a really, really bad disease uh, that can contribute greatly to the morbidity and mortality of patients. And then throw on top of that other things that we see that are going to compromise your immune system or the integrity of your immune response, right? And that's going to be, you know, chronic alcoholism, you know, intravenous drug abuse, where you're constantly exposing your body to antigens and to pathogens and things like that. Um, you know, chronic wounds where there's just a, a festering open place for, for these bacteria to enter and get in. And then HIV, some immunocompromising disease. You know, these are various different things uh, that put you at risk and further expand that out a little bit to other things that we see um, in the ED. You know, you can add in, you know, advancing age, peripheral vascular disease. So we talked to Dr. Persky a couple weeks ago uh, about the effects of vascular disease and, you know, you know, having just poor vascular flow on the arterial side and poor venous return turn on the venous side really sets patients up for risk for, you know, either insufficient, you know, vascular flow to get immune material to the site or sets the patient up for risk for having these chronic wounds uh, that serve as the source of all this, right? So all that's really bad, right? And you kind of add on, you know, you know, heart disease, renal failure, things like that. Those are, you know, things that alter uh, our ability to perfuse and, you know, again, our risk factors for why patients may develop necrotizing fasciitis, right? And again, uh, coming back to it, diabetes is a severe reason why patients have very, very bad disease uh, and something that we should definitely take very, very seriously. So mental health break, kind of a cognitively clearing. Uh, here's a nice historical picture of our fair city um, taken from the air, certainly not from one of our helicopters. Uh, and you can see how much has changed over the course of, of the years since this one was taken. Um, but moving forward, um, what you end up having uh, when you get necrotizing fasciitis is you get this development of a local infection, right? And that's what we talked about with skin and soft tissue part one, right? Where we talked about the cellulitis, I talked about the abscess. You get that, um, that infection, right? It gets, d gets down deep, gets towards the fascia. You start getting more and more tissue necrosis. Now, theoretically, you can argue that an abscess would have some of this tissue necrosis. So it's on that spectrum disease. But with ne necrotizing fasciitis, you get necrosis of kind of that skin, that subcutaneous layer. And then you get down to the fascia, right? And it just spreads, right? That's basically a highway to kind of move the thing up and down the fascia where you have this infection, this necrotic infection that spreads under the surface and then necrosis its way back up, which is where you kind of get that flesh eating concept for this flesh eating bacteria and necrotizing fasciitis. So as we think about this from more of a, a pathologic perspective, there's, you'll see in the literature, there's really two types of necrotizing fasciitis that we, that we talk about that we, um, that are, that are described type one and type two, very, very descriptively named, right? Um, but type one necrotizing fasciitis is essentially a polymicrobial, uh, infection. It consists of about 50 to 70 some odd percent of the patients that we see with necrotizing fasciitis have type one, right? And the, the typical bacteria are things like bacteroides or clostridium, um, you know, or other polysyllabic bacteria, um, you know, and it's this mixed aerobic anaerobic infection, right? Which is why you kind of go broad spectrum when we start talking about, you know, how we initially treat this, you know, prior to getting your surgical uh, debridement, right? So that's type one. Again, I'm not going to belabor that too much because you really can't differentiate type one versus type two with ultrasound. But type two is kind of the other one that we would here described in the literature, uh, and that is this monomicrobial, uh, tends to be like group A sta uh, strap, you know, staph species. Um, and these are interestingly are the non gas producing organisms, right? Um, 
which actually becomes a little bit important when it pertains to ultrasound because one of the clinical features that we will see later on here as we get through this presentation is air in the subcutaneous tissue uh, is, is, is something that is part of the necrotizing fasciitis spectrum of, of findings, right? And so um, if you don't have air, maybe it's a it's a type two, um, but one of the things we'll typically see is that air in the tissues, and that would, I guess, point us more towards a type one, but we're still gonna treat them, you know, from an initial antibiotic standpoint, all about the same, right? So if you wanna look at it from kind of a, a graphical perspective, you get this local infection, infection, you have this tissue ischemia, which may be kind of making at least the milieu not is, is, uh, is good, which then results in decreased host defenses. Your bacteria really love that environment because there's no competition and they get to proliferate. And that just perpetuates this cycle of, of the infection, kind of this necrotizing fasciitis that just gets worse and worse and worse and worse, right? Um, so once you get that bacterial proliferation, what you're going to have is then all the byproducts of that bacterial infection, right? That CO2, the water, um, and all the anaerobic byproducts, you know, all those other gases um, that are going to be resultant um, and we're going to see some of the evidence of this with the edema, with the subcutaneous fluid, with the air in the soft tissues um, as we scan through this, right? So what do we need uh, for a sufficient defense against this? I mean, obviously you need a functional immune system and you need good vascular flow. So anything that, again, and I keep coming back to this because it keeps reminding ourselves of risk factors, anything that's going to compromise these things, your immune system, number one, or your, va your ability to get you know, blood to and from the area is going to put you at increased risk for necrotizing fasciitis, right? So as we kind of get close to the end of this clinical segment before we get to the ultrasound, what do we need to do, right? It's the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. And I like to tell our residents, hey, you know, all this whole, especially the early residents, all this whole medicine thing is very complex, right? It's it's kind of dizzying the degree of complexity that we're trying to piece through on a daily basis with all the patients. But the fortunate thing in medicine is as the patients get sicker, the algorithms get easier, right? To the point where I feel like you're kind of dying in front of us, the CPR algorithm is airway, breathing, circulation. And if you don't have evidence of one of them being spontaneous, you just keep that cycle on repeat, right? Um, and then only when they're living do they actually get more complicated with the other things. So the initial algorithm is your, your ABCs. You know, manage your airway, manage your breathing, manage your circulation. The circulation is probably going to be your biggest issue, but if they're in fulminant sepsis, you may need to take that airway just to take that work of breathing off of them, um, you know, to be able to manage manage the patient. And then you're going to go into the, your steps of resuscitation, whether it be fluid resuscitation, um, you know, the antibiotic resuscitation, things like that. And then you're going to refer them on for operative debridement for um, for their uh, for their necrotizing fasciitis. There is some thought that hyperbaric therapy may be of benefit, but again, it, we're not a hyperbaric center, and I think the be we're probably worst thing you can do uh, for someone who's acutely ill in you know hemodynamic compromised state is to put them in a chamber where you cannot have access to them for an hour right, um, and transport them to that chamber. So it's probably not the mainstay of our treatment here once, you know, we're going to get down to the, the operative debridement here. You know? So again, the biggest factor to, for survival, you know, we keep harping on this idea of time is tissue in the brain, in the heart, in other infarcted tissues, right? Same thing here. Time is tissue, right? Um, the biggest factor for survival for these patients is how quickly can you get them to the operating room, right? So what does this look like? Um, I've got a couple images. These are compliments, um, of my father-in-law who is newly retired. He was a pediatrician in West Africa for almost two decades um, and saw a number of cases of necrotizing fasciitis out there. So these, these photos are courtesy of Dr. Ebersole um, from, from Togo, West Africa. But you basically can see just this necrotic tissue that eats away at that normal subcutaneous infrastructure uh, of these patients, right? So there's a hand. Here is an example of necrotizing fasciitis of the neck, which could be really bad because you have a lot of fascial planes that lead to really, really important places. Uh, another one of the neck, um, you know, getting operative debridement. And then again, with skin grafting, you know, some very positive outcomes here. Um, but in our circumstance, right, we may not see these things as profound because, you know, over in West Africa, things tend to wait a while before they come in. What we might see is something like this, right? In a lot of the cases of necrotizing fasciitis, this is what I see, right? Overlying skin erythema, right? You might have a little bit of a wound, um, but really it just looks like bad cellulitis. Um, and we're going to have to then tease out what cases of this bad cellulitis are actual necrotizing fasciitis. And so from a clinical standpoint, you're going to think about 
erythema, but pain out of proportion, right? And even pain out of the zone of erythema. So they have a red spot, but it hurts surrounding there, right? That's evidence of that uh, um, that fascial spread that you're just not yet seeing at the skin surface, right? And some other factors that are in the literature of things that you can see is this brawny edema or crepitance or even bole, but certainly none of these or the absence of, of, of any of these doesn't necessarily rule out necrotizing fasciitis, right? So gets us to this quote, often the early stages of neck fash is a clinically indistinguishable from other soft tissue infections such as cellulitis erysipelas and making the diagnosis can it be difficult and so in large part our job is basically hunting for this needle that is in the haystack which can be really really dizzying uh, prospect from time to time so fortunately this is this is a rare condition but it is serious right carries up a, a very large mortality and your operative time is the most important feature that's going to help the patient do well so with that introduction in mind right that terrifying clinical description of necrotizing fasciitis we're all probably sitting here like great now what do i do like it seems like i'm just screwed no matter how i approach this patient how in the world do i get to the bottom of this without referring all of my cellular cases for operative intervention right well there's a couple ways that we can get at this the first one is just with clinical assessment right and there's this thing that was developed called the larynx score uh, which is an attempt at finding some form of risk stratification tool that will help us identify which patients have necrotizing fasciitis. Um, this is a screenshot from uh, MD Calc. You can look it up on MD Calc uh, and use that on your phone or on a, a workstation at the, comp at the computer. But essentially, it's uh, you know a combination of the factors called you know using the CRP, using a white count, using a hemoglobin. What's their sodium? What's their creatinine? What's their glucose? So just a bunch of labs that we normally get. You know, maybe you'd have to add the CRP and think about it. You know, to calculate the Lorenic score. Um, but if you have a score that's equal to or greater than six, then your risk for necrotizing fasciitis goes. Way Way, 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 way up, right? Um, they did some studies on this in the derivation sample, right? The sensitivity and specificity of the score was like through the roof. It looked really, really good. But as always, when you do your validation sample, um, the test characteristics kind of normalize down to something that's a little bit more realistic, right? And so the bottom line is the Lorenic score is poorly sensitive to rule out necrotizing fasciitis, but it may not do a bad job of pointing you down that road if that's something that you think the patient has, right? So I guess the bottom line here is clinically, this isn't really going to be sufficient, right? We need to have some other method of identifying these patients to really figure out who has necrotizing fasciitis and who we need to take to the OR, right? And that's where imaging comes into play, right? And there's various different options of imaging that, that we can apply in this particular scenario, right? The first one is x-ray imaging. Um, and essentially, because it's a shadowgram, right? It's sh shooting x-rays through a leg or through an arm and looking at kind of the density of those x-rays um, or how, how much of those x-rays are blocked essentially uh, by this the tissues that they're passed through um, all we can really say is that there's maybe some thickening in the subcutaneous you know tissues um, and is there gas in the tissues and really if you get an x-ray and see gas in the tissues then kind of it's going to lead you down this route um, but by itself is not going to be a great rule in rule uh, well i guess not rule out technique right uh, here's an example of of an x-ray uh, where you can see that gas in that tissue um, looking uh, to suggest the necrotizing infection in this this foot, right? Uh, which is going to lead us to CT scan, right? So CT is going to be probably the most ubiquitously available uh, test, at least in the emergency department in the United States. Um, if you are in some remote, austere environment, that's probably not going to be the case because I don't really carry a CT scan in my pocket. Uh, but it's something that you know we have available to us in our in our EDs, and it's pretty rapid. The downside is it's going to be you know, take time, it's going to cost money, it's going to be ionizing radiation to the patient, right? But what the CT is going to look for is this soft tissue gas, it's going to be able to tell us that there's fascial thickening and fat stranding. Um, it's going to tell you like what the quality of those muscles look like, um, what this quality of the subcutaneous tissue looks like. And it's going to give us a very broad based, large anatomy area of visualization view of what's going on in this patient. So it's actually not a bad study. And when the surgeons ask for it, don't balk and complain and say, but my ultrasound, 
ultrasound showed it uh, because it actually gives a good, um, unlike our ultrasound, it gives us a broad view of what's going on around the tissues, right? That skin and soft tissue area um, and how much uh, tissue is involved. So it's going to be helpful for the surgeons as they, they do their surgical planning. So here's an example of some air uh, in the soft tissues in this patient's thigh, right? Uh, so the case from Radiopedia. Um, another case, if we scan over here, you can see just air tracking up and down the, the subcutaneous layers and the muscular layers in this patient's thigh. And this is bad news, right? This is going to be something that needs antibiotics admitted, OR, things like that, right? Um, here's another example. You can see kind of the medial aspect of the thigh that's on the left. Um, you can see just kind of that subcutaneous, um, the, the density in the medial aspect there with some, you know, some little ditzels of air inside there, all representative of, of necrotizing fasciitis in these patients. Um, now, the question is, what's the characteristics, test characteristics of CT scan? Not bad, right? Certainly, if, if it's down in the 80% the sensitivity, it may be problematic. Um, the specificity, you know, it's not horrible. You know, it's probably about the best we can do for um, some really quick, uh, ubiquitously available uh, imaging. So uh, there's a reason why this is, this is re, um, routinely asked for, right? But the better study, if you want a better test characteristic study, is going to be your MRI, right? And so on the T1, you're going to look for some loss of the muscle architecture. And on the T2 uh, sequences, you're going to look for that subcutaneous and muscular edema with subfascial fluid collections, things like that. Stuff that looks a lot like this. And since I'm not a radiologist, this really doesn't mean a ton uh, to me other than it just doesn't look normal. Um, and MRI um, really has got a better sensitivity uh, than than CT scan, right? It's that approaching that 100% sensitivity. Uh, so statistically speaking, it's the better test, but you know, it may not always be available. It certainly takes forever to do, right? And um, you know, it requires someone to do it. And if they have metal in their body, then it becomes problematic. So there's all sorts of reasons why MRI may not be logistically something that's feasible for your patient. So that brings us to this concept of can we use ultrasound to evaluate for necrotizing fasciitis? And the fact that we're spending a whole hour on it today would kind of belie the point that the answer is yes, um, but maybe the better response should be, well, since we can use ultrasound to evaluate for necrotizing fasciitis, what are the test characteristics that I need to be alert for? Uh, or the, the sonographic findings I need to be alert for, and what are the test characteristics so that I know how to best deploy this tool when I'm evaluating patients for this particular clinical entity, right? And that's maybe the focus that we want to put on, on our ultrasound section today. Uh, so as a reminder, this is the example of normal tissue that we've been uh, looking back at and referring back at for the last few weeks, right? You can see the very, very top layers in your, your um, epidermis and the dermis, uh, that marbled layer that you know comprises the first quarter um, of, of thickness is going to be your subcutaneous fatty tissue layer. Deep to that is going to be that muscle layer. It's kind of that coarsely striated muscle. Uh, and you can see even on the left-hand side, just the bone uh, next to that. So those are the various different types of soft tissue that we see uh, as we're scanning. So when we take this image, right, we're going to obviously distort that when we make this infected, you know, when we give this necrotizing fasciitis. So what are those different findings? that we would expect to see in necrotizing fasciitis. And those are gonna be the following, right? The first one is gonna be something we talked about already, right? Diffuse subcutaneous thickening, right? And if you go back two weeks ago and look at the video from the, the first time the soft tissue for cellulitis versus abscess, one of the key features that you're gonna see in cellulitis is the same thing, this diffuse subcutaneous thickening. And this represents that inflammatory response that's going on in the tissues, right? And we did a long talk about that, so go back and look at that if you haven't. Um, but we're going to see this subcutaneous thickening uh, in that area that's going to be inflamed, right, and infected, right? Uh, here's an example of that thickening. You see that homogenization of the echo texture. You see the increased echogenicity compared to the surrounding structures. Uh, you may see some of that fluid um, that's tracking throughout the, the tissues. And as you compare it to normal tissue, it's going to be thicker, right? That that bright gray area is thicker than if you were going up to non-inflamed tissue uh, and scanning up there, right? So that's number one. Number two, and this is where we start differentiating things out into necrotizing fasciitis itself, as opposed to just a skin and soft tissue infection, is this perifascial fascia 
fluid, right? And we talked a lot about the physiology just a little bit ago about how it's an infection that gets down to that fascia and then spreads along that fascia and it leaves its debris uh, at the level of the fascia, right? And we see a lot of that fluid that collects along the fascia. So we can see that bright white line that separates, um, well, let's turn the image on. Now you can see it. The bright white line that separates the muscle compartment uh, at the bottom from the, the very, you know, inflamed, infected skin and soft tissue compartment, that bright white line and just above it is a trace bit of fluid, right? Now the question becomes, and I actually have asked this one clinically, um, of, you know, of myself and then, you know, my fellowship director when I was in fellowship was like, well, how much fluid do I need to really have to be worried, right? Because uh, maybe you have a little wisp of fluid, but, you know, are we going to refer all those for anachronizing fasciitis, you know, or is there some amount of fluid or some characterization of that fluid that's going to point us more towards that neck fascia, you know, result and, and kind of get us down that trail, right? Um, and so if you look through the literature, here's an example from an article um, uh, showing like a thick band of fluid just above that fascia. If you look in the literature, they, they say there's a couple different numbers that are thrown out. Um, the one that I saw just you know, a couple minutes before this lecture is, is kind of reminding myself of some of this material is if the thickness of that fluid along the fascia is two millimeters or more, then you really have to be worried about necrotizing fasciitis, right? Um, the previous literature I saw was four millimeters. Um, regardless, if you see a collection of fluid um, along that tracks along that fascia, uh, this certainly should raise our level of concern for this entity that we call or are calling necrotizing fasciitis, right? And this is really going to be the first main clinical hallmark that we should you know be looking out for as we're scanning. Um, and what I when I say that is like as you scan just regular cellulitis, look at the fascia, right? Make sure that there's nothing down there that's going to get you more worried um, than you already are when you just kind of walk in clinically, right? So that's number one or number two actually. Um, kind of a recap, diffuse subcutaneous thickening, perifascial fluid. And number three could be a thickened or irregular fascia, right? And it, it, it makes sense as you think about this, as you inflame something, that something is going to thicken. We, I mean, we see this all over the place. We see this in obviously the skin and soft tissue modules that we've been talking about. But think back about our gallbladder, right? When we talk about gallbladder scanning, what is one of the hallmarks of cholecystitis? Well, I mean, it's the stones, but it's also that gallbladder wall thickening. Right, you see that thickening of the gallbladder wall that represents the inflammation of that gallbladder wall, uh, and so this is this this theme of thickening kind of tracks through this whole idea of inflammatory conditions. Right, you can talk about it in bowel wall thickening is that inflammation. Right, so thickening or irregularity of that fascia could be representing um, this necrotizing fasciitis. And so here's an example where you can just see kind of that irregular fascia, um, or if you want to put some arrows around it, you can see just kind of that really thickened very irregular. It's not that thin, bright white line. It's just this just chunky fascia uh, layer uh, should really get us concerned that this patient has necrotizing fasciitis, right? So that's number one, two, and three. The final characteristic that we're going to talk about is this idea of subcutaneous air. Um, you know, my, uh, my fellowship director, when I was going through fellowship, is Dr. Bob Jones, one of our faculty here, and he is always said, and it's always stuck with me, air in the wrong place is always a bad thing, right? Um, when you scan and you see air, where air ought not to be, that should catch your attention and make you ask the question, why is that air there? Right. And we uh, we can see that in the liver. We can see that in the gallbladder. We can see that, um, you know, in the I mean, obviously, air is supposed to be in the lungs, um, but we can see that in, you know, if you have. I don't want air embolus in the heart. I'm just making stuff up now. Um, but here, if you see air in the subcutaneous tissue, you need to ask yourself, why is that air here? And remember when we were talking about the type one versus the type two, that type one is the aerobic and anaerobic bacteria, and they're the gas producing bacteria. And so when you have necrotizing fasciitis, it may produce that gas that lives in that soft tissue area. Clinically, it may be palpable as that crepitance or that rice crispy feelings. And sonographically, we'll see that as these little ditzels of air throughout the subcutaneous tissue. And what I have found is I've seen this a couple times throughout my career is not only do you see those bright white areas of of air, right? That and maybe that catches what catches your eye. But what's always caught my eye is I put the probe down and I don't see anything, right? And by anything, I just see just solid wall of gray. Like there's I'm expecting to see some tissue architecture, some something or other. And I don't. And then when I focus a little bit more close, I'm like, 
there's those tit, uh, little bits of air. And what when I'm seeing that, quote, nothing, what I'm actually seeing is the shadowing, that dirty shadowing that emanates from that air in the soft tissue area, right? Uh, it's very disquieting view when you put that down, you see like, all I see is just solid wall of gray and nothing, right? That should immediately click in your mind. There's air in that tissue for whatever reason, right? If you can see this in subcutaneous air from like a pneumothorax, right? You can see it in subcutaneous air from necrotizing fasciitis. So here's an example. You can see those ditzels of air in that subcutaneous tissue with that dirty shadowing deep to that, giving it kind of that weird, just like no differentiation of any tissue structure uh, shadowing uh, in this image. Uh, here's another example. You can see that ditzels of air with some shadowing deep to that that's going to represent necrotizing fasciitis in this image right um so how often do you see some of the stuff um you know you see subcutaneous fatty changes a lot right um some of the fascial tissues some of the muscle changes um you know a little less frequently but certainly the things that you need to be looking out for right so what does the literature say about necrotizing fasciitis and what's interesting is there's not a ton of literature out there and i just did a a, a recent or I guess earlier today I was kind of perusing this again. Um, it's found a case series, which I'll or not a case series, but a, um, a, a review paper that I'll show you here at the end. Um, and it really was kind of indicative of what I've already seen. There's not a ton of literature about necrotizing fasciitis with ultrasound as compared to other modalities. Uh, but a lot of this literature starts with case series, right? Case presentations, case series. And so here's a case series from 2016 where they're describing necrotizing fasciitis. Again, another case series from 2013 uh, describing kind of some of these sonographic findings of necrotizing fasciitis that we talked about. Um, here's one by a friend of our, uh, our division, Dr. Tom Curl, uh, who published a case of necrotizing fasciitis that he identified that was uh, radio not apparent on CT and MRI. Uh, so the patient had you know findings that were concerning on ultrasound, was referred for CT MRI, MRI was, and CT were read as negative, uh, but the patient got really, really, really sick and worse and was eventually, uh, the diagnosis was made. And so he was, his argument is, hey, maybe we caught this a little bit earlier with our ultrasound in, in ways that we wouldn't have seen um, as early on our CT or our MRI, right? Um, so those are a bunch of case series. Now, as we kind of get into more of the, what does the literature say? about you know how to do this and the things to look out for and how to kind of pursue this um, this was a, a paper that was done in 2014 I quoted from it earlier um, but they recommend the staff model right a mnemonic that you can use to help remember the different features that we just talked about right and that's gonna be subcutaneous thickening which is the s the t is going to be the thickening part a is the air in the tissues and the f is that fascial fluid so if you see thickening air in the tissues fascial fluid that should kind of clue your mind into this is necrotizing fasciitis i need to get a surgical consult to see what i need to do next um, now you may be asking well what is the sensitivity specificity of ultrasound for necrotizing fasciitis um, and so this paper was published a while ago um, they reported that the sensitivity and specificity of ultrasound is 88 percent and 93 percent um, to me that seems a little bit bullish right uh, it seems like um, it's a little better than probably what reality is um, However, this paper has been quoted multiple times over the course of the years in other papers. And so um, these are the numbers that you'll find you know, published out in the literature. And so I think what it helps us to understand is ultrasound is not bad. In fact, it plays well in that armamentarium or the set, the, the set of tools that we have to evaluate for it. The one downside or maybe the, the several downside or limitations to ultrasound is number one, it only gives a very focal view of the tissue, right? And so if you want a more global understanding of what's going on in that area, you either have to scan a lot or you need to get a CT scan to quantify how much tissue is involved other than the fact that you have tissue and so I think this is kind of leads us to takeaway number one is ultrasound probably is not your best rule out test but when you see it on a patient you're like hmm the characteristics of this one the specificity is actually pretty good I need to further dig into this one right um, so it's going to be that hook that gets you into the diagnostic and the therapeutic pathway for necrotizing fasciitis um, while it certainly can be used as you know to look for it and kind of like risk stratify I think the best test utilization or test characteristic utilization is your scanning skin and soft tissue infection and it's like oh this is worse than I thought right and gets you down that pathway so um, that's kind of how I interpret this literature. 
Here's that case series that I, uh, or the case review that I uh, referenced just a few minutes ago. This one was published this last year, uh, just taking as many articles as they could find. I think they, you know, basically took 50 articles and kind of summarized them. Um, And there's a lot of case presentations that, you know, are involved in this literature base. Uh, But they basically brought it down to two sentinel papers. One was that staff paper. The other we looked at the other one um, mentioned this SEFE kind of framework is what they called it. But essentially, it's four steps of scan, look for fascial fluid. Are there any other supporting findings? If yes, then call surgery and then have and work with your surgeons to to sort that out, which brings us nicely to kind of the approach to how we should manage uh, and handle um, and integrate ultrasound into this evaluation for necrotizing fasciitis. The first one is just the clinical evaluation. Like we're going to see the patients. We're going to really kind of get them on the map, right? If they came in and said, I just twisted my ankle today and my ankle sore. Well, that's not getting us on the map. But if they come in and say, hey, I've got, you know, this area of red in this area of pain and oh by the way I'm a diabetic and I haven't taken my insulin in about a year and a half and my sugars are about 400 you know these are going to be things that are going to hmm, the light bulbs should be going off cluing us into what's going on right uh, from there you know that may prompt us to getting some labs uh, and doing a bedside ultrasound right and as we start seeing these findings on our ultrasound then that increases our our concern right uh, and we when we see these evidence of, of necrotizing fasciitis then that should prompt that surgical consult and again you know, get the CT. That's the language that we need to, to speak to talk to our surgeons. Um, but it helps us identify who would be the best person to get that CT to kind of further characterize things. And then from there, you work with your surgeons to, you know, appropriately antibiose and take the patient to the operating room for debridement. So hopefully that's helpful kind of as we understand the idea, kind of backing up of what is necrotizing fasciitis? Is this, you know, necrosing infection uh, that spreads along the fascia that leads to severe, severe sepsis? multi-organ failure and death, right? We talked about who to look for it in, uh, what are the clinical features, how do we find this, both on a clinical assessment, using some labs with the Larynx score, using some of the different imaging care- tests that we have, finally culminating in what does this look like on ultrasound so that when we scan these patients, we are more aware of what we're seeing and we can more promptly get these patients to where they need to be, which is on an operating table. So with that being said, I'm going to open things up. Are there any questions, comments, concerns, Things that you guys would like to mention um, or address here uh, as we kind of wrap things up for today about necrotizing fasciitis.